transmission characteristics suggest that, early, uh, that a natural herd immunity strategy uh, is unlikely to be feasible and, and uh, countries need to respond um, um, uh, forcefully. Um, underlying dynamics of the pandemic. And so this paper's goal was at that time in, in February, March, uh, to address some of these dynamics, um, dynamic questions that help guide decision makers towards longer term, high leverage strategies. And to illustrate this need, we all like to show that France was really only able to test the, the severe high end cases and therefore um, they only captured, you know, the, the, a small fraction of the cases um, leading um, to, to less effectiveness to um, suppress contact, social contacts of infected cases, um, leading you in, in, in turn to, to get further behind with your testing capacity. So that's our goal. Now, it is not enough to just show that fit to the data. What helps us build confidence in the results are a few additional tests. First is some out of sample predictions that estimate uh, the models um, up to the data up to August 10th and then predict until November 1st. They, show reasonable uh, overall fit for the longer term projections, but also with several uh, significant deviations. We can see. But herd immunity is not yet close for the vast majority of countries. In fact, the time it takes to get to herd immunity are in the hundreds to thousands of days for most countries based on the current rates. So herd immunity is not even a, a viable uh, pathway an interesting uh, question that has been kind of in everybody's mind is how much of a trade-off do we have between economic costs and the uh, public health costs of COVID? And a good proxy for economic costs is how much you reduce your contacts. Uh, so if you map the relationship between the reproduction number, which is essentially a proxy for how much interactions there are and infectious interactions there are against death uh, daily deaths per million of the population, you look at the data, the surprising result is that there is no trade-off between the two. That is, essentially, every country goes to reproduction number of around one. Why? Because if it is about one, the epidemic continues to grow exponentially. This means huge costs, huge death tolls around us, and that forces people to bring down their contacts. And if it goes below one, death rates go down, and people stop uh, to care. Uh, so, we have all of this model available uh, for anybody interested. Uh, on an online simulator, we have added a vaccination sector to the model that allows you to change and see how changes in responsiveness and vaccination can impact the uh, forward-looking trajectory of the epidemic, as well as the backward. You can see the quality of the fit with data. For, this. for any of you who doubted that system dynamics can be very evidence-based, all the presentations today should disabuse you of that idea. We all use data and it's very important that we understand what's going on mechanically and that we also check our models against data. Well, is that, you know, comparing, uh, uh, looking at the other models that were available uh, from uh, Princeton, from Harvard, from Yale, you know, many of them lack endogenous uh, social behavior. And so they can reliably project only about one month and they, and the, the, the modelers say, well, you, you can't possibly project past one month. Well, in system dynamics, we believe you can do better than that, that, that it is possible to, to find some rules of behavior that people follow uh, uh, even when they're presented with newspaper articles that tell them how bad it is, they will still do these things because of social structures, because of norms and pressures that we can see cumulative COVID fatalities, uh, with January of 2020 through January of 2022. Uh, here is January of 20, th this is where we are right now. And you see these four different scenarios um, uh, resulting in different uh, amounts of, of uh, death. So, uh, so the very best one is the blue line where we have the best effectiveness. That's a cumulative dead by um, January of 2022 of 585,000 all the way to the worst one uh, where you have unsafe behavior, lower adoption, less effectiveness. Interestingly, when I added all policies together, I got way better results. And that's one of the things that, you know, we who work in uh, complex systems, we kind of understand this because, you know, you, uh, there are tipping points in these systems. And when you add uh, four policies, you get more outcomes than, you know, uh, 
effect of each of those, sum of effect of each of those. And when you reflect on what is going on in, in the situation of COVID-19, I would say that this problem has been so complex that needed including communities, needed including uh, data, and it needed uh, having models that address behavioral challenges that we see and uh, they affect the transmission of the disease. Thank you. For that, um, you don't necessarily have to have confidence intervals. You don't necessarily have to have operational details. So, so useful, I think, is context dependent. In the general case, I think the long-term trajectory of these epidemic models usually fail uh, to be easy to predict because the behavioral responses that change the infectivity and transmission rates are not fully predictable. Now, the models that do have endogenous uh, behavioral responses do a better job, and I think that's what we see across all of the models that uh, we saw today that allow you to predict, to project for a few months ahead with reasonable success. But it's very important, and that's about we want to fix uh, the society. So if our model is projecting something bad, so if I'm modeling, my model projects that something bad is happening in universities, if I've done a good job, actually I should make uh, the society move in a direction that my prediction becomes wrong, right? So I should have a good impact. So we move in the correct direction. That doesn't mean that my model was bad, but I actually did a good impact on the society to move it in the Thank you, um, Naveed, Hazir, Jerome, and Jack for a very informative session. And um, welcome you all to join us for future seminars, which will be happening next year. Also want to point out that we're in the renewal season right now. And one of the major benefits of um, membership is free access to all seminars. This was special because we have a commitment to allowing free access to COVID seminars, but uh, the remainder of our, our seminar series are a member benefit. So we, we hope that you'll join us for that.